Hello, and this week we're going to talk about branches and branch statements and comparisons and all sorts of stuff involving logic. Um, so what is a branch statement? A branch statement is a statement which allows your program to be able to make a decision. Um, this is really helpful. It's almost needed, right, in, in a program where you're writing it ahead of time for sort of a generic who knows what's going to happen situation later on. Um, and so the idea is your program needs to be able to make a decision. It's going to have to choose between sort of one path and another, which is why I call them branch statements. Um, it's like a fork in the road. Although you could have more than you know two paths, you could have you know all sorts of different configurations. Um, but they're almost always associated with this word if. So if something is true, we're going to follow a particular path. If not, we're going to do something else. Um, you probably make if statements all the time in your life, right? It's not that difficult. So here we've got a um, sort of a simple, you know, program flow chart for a very simple program that starts and then asks, what's the greatest band of all time? It gets an answer from the user. And then you see this sort of diamond shape. Diamond shapes are usually where you get branches uh, if you're using sort of classical, you know, flow charting methods. Um, and so the answer is, if the answer is the Beatles, is this Yes or no, right? So they gave me an answer. Is that answer the Beatles? Yes, then I print that is correct. No, you are wrong. Um, you may not like the Beatles, but based purely on metrics. I mean, clearly the greatest band of all time. Um, but you can kind of see how it makes a branch, right? If there's a fork in the road. We're going to take one path or another based on some situation that we can compare something to. So this is the generic um, sort of the generic syntax for a branch statement in C++. There's going to be an if, and then after the if in parentheses, there's going to be some sort of a conditional statement. We'll talk about what those look like later. But then after that if and it's conditional, uh, there's going to be some curly braces. That curly brace, those curly braces are going to define a block of code with one or more commands, um, and those commands. Are going to be executed only if that conditional statement turns out to be true. Otherwise, we have this else block. Now notice the else block doesn't have a conditional statement. That's because it's the default. If that's not true, then you are definitely doing this, at least in our very simple is if else situation, right? Um, and so these two things are mutually exclusive. We are either going to do the first block of commands or we are going to do the second block of commands but we are not going to do both. There is never a situation in which we will do both, right? Um, it is a fork in the road. Now, after this if-else, after that last curly brace, then we're going to sort of reconverge, and anything we write down there will be commands that are executed regardless of the conditional statement. But that's because we've passed the fork and have remerged to back together. So let's look at an example. If I have a string, answer to my earlier thing is queen, uh, which happens to be my favorite band of all time. Um, if answer is equal to the Beatles, well, that conditional expression, right, and just you're going to have to trust me that double equals is comparing those two things, is answer equal to the Beatles. Um, for me, that's incorrect, right? So I am not going to execute that top block of commands. Instead, you have an else clause, so that else block uh, is what is actually going to get executed, and we're going to print, you are wrong, because apparently I am. Although, actually, I still love the Beatles, so, you know, I could go either way. But still, in this particular situation, we will print out, you are wrong. So, what is a conditional expression? A conditional expression is usually something that compares something to something else. Um, in the case of strings, usually are they, you know, equivalent, did you give the right answer? Um, is it this person's name? I'm looking for a particular, um, you know, email address, perhaps. Um, see if a username has already exists in the database to see whether or not you can take it. Um, if you've ever tried to, you know, create a username on social media, you know what I'm talking about. They've all been taken. Um, and so you're comparing something. Obviously, with math, you can get a little bit more fine-tuned. So let's look at some of these operators that we can use in our expressions to compare things. Um, less than, greater than, you already know what those mean, right? Three is less than four, that evaluates to tr true. Three is greater than four, we'll evaluate to false, right? Because that's a false statement. Um, less than or equal to, we don't have 
um, that symbol on your keyboard. Um, and I don't believe ASCII actually has that symbol, although you can get it in like Word or something that uses UTF-8. Um, but less than or equal to, we just use two characters. And even though it's two characters, it's still considered one operator, right? It's less than or equal to. And in that case, they're both going to return the exact same thing as before. But if I said four less than four, that evaluates to false. Four less than or equal to four evaluates to true because equal was an option, right? It's just a matter of do you count that last thing? Um, and notice if you say it the way, if you write the characters the way you say it, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, you'll always get them in the right order. Sometimes because the less than or equal to looks like an arrow, people do it for the greater than or equal to, but it doesn't work that way. It's greater than or equal to. To check for equality, you use two equal signs. Now, why do you use two equal signs? It's because we already have another operator that uses the single equal sign, and that's the assignment operator. So assignment is different than comparison. Two equal signs will compare to see if two things are equal. Um, and in C++, you can actually use strings with that too. Um, it's, strings are overloaded for that. Uh, but um, you can't just use a single equals. That'll be an assignment and will have a different effect. Um, not equals to is just exclamation point equals because the exclamation point, sometimes called a bang, um, is considered not, right? So not equals, bang equals. Uh, and by the way, I think IT people say bang just because exclamation point has a lot of syllables to it. Bang is so much easier. It has those, you, you know, it's an exclamation point. So these are some comparison operators that we can use. The expressions that come out of those will have a type called have a type of bool, right? It's true or false, um, and that's because some operations or some expressions are mathematical, right? So like two plus three is equal to five. That has two plus three. That expression has a numeric answer to it, but two less than three or two greater than three that doesn't have a numeric answer. Its answer is either true or false, right? That, that statement is either true or false. So it has more of a logical answer. Um, and so the type for those expressions will be Boolean. In the same way that if you added uh, an integer to a floating point number, the result of that will be a floating point type, right? When you evaluate the expression. Just with these logical operators, when you evaluate the expression, you get a bool, true or false. So here we've got a couple examples. Now here I'm actually creating sort of, sometimes it's called a flag, uh, but you can actually create variables that are of type bool. So here I've created a bool called is popular, and I've set it, I've assigned it the value followers greater than 5,000, right? So now where's followers coming from? That must be somewhere else in the program, right? But like I look at your followers, if your followers are greater than 5,000, notice it's greater than, if you have exactly 5,000 followers, is popular is false. At 5001, is popular is true. Um, and so then I can use that, you know, because all those comparisons, right, they evaluate to a bool, I can actually just use that bool as my conditional, you know, for branching, right? So I can just say, if is popular, see out you are an influencer. Done, right? Like that's easy. It's you know, it's right there. In fact, it almost, almost makes sense in English, not very good English, but like just reading that, you could probably get the meaning of it, right? If is popular, you're an influencer. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, Boolean types, you can create them, you can use them, and all of those conditional expressions like followers greater than 5,000 will evaluate to a Boolean, either true or false. Uh, by the way, notice, there's never a semicolon used after the if or else or else if when we eventually talk about that option. Um, the semicolons are just at the end of the lines. Normally you would have curly braces um, right after the if to sort of define a block of code, but you don't have to put a semicolon after the if. In fact, if you do, you actually have created a block of code that contains nothing. So you're going to execute the next line no matter what. The other thing to notice is that I didn't use curly braces in this, right? Why didn't I use curly braces? Because I only have one line of code. If you only have one line of code, you don't need curly braces. 
you are just only sort of protecting that one line under the if. If I were to write another line of code, even though it was indented, right, because indentation, white space means nothing to C++, does in other languages like Python, but not C++, um, I'm going to execute that, that next line no matter what, because only the first line will be protected by the if. That's why we put in curly braces. I will say this is a stylistic thing. Some people do not like using this. They put in curly braces no matter what. In fact, if you work for Google, Google requires you to put in curly braces no matter what, even if it's only one line, because they think it hurts readability. Um, that is a stylistic thing. I will let you make that decision. Actually, it's irrelevant, right? If you end up working for a large company, they will probably have a style guide for their code. Uh, you just do whatever the people who are paying you <laughs> want you to do, right? Uh, I don't know why Google decided you must have curly braces for branch statements, but they did, and they pay well. So you're probably not going to feel bad about typing a couple curly braces. But you don't have to. C++ doesn't require it. Also notice, I don't have an else, right? There is no other branch. If this thing is true, I'm going to do this side thing. But then no matter what, we start on with the next line of code, right? So it's you don't have to have an else just because you have an if. You have to have an if in order to have an else. An else wouldn't make sense without an if. But um, if an if else statement is like a fork in the road, then an if statement by itself is sort of like a vista point on the freeway. You can exit the freeway and go check out the vista point, and then you get right back onto the freeway with everybody else. It's just like an optional side route, only if you actually are popular in this case. Now, We've got a couple little comparisons, some conditionals. Let's expand that and create more complex ideas and expressions by using some logic. So we're going to add in some logical expressions here um, and using logical operators. The three that we're going to talk about today are and, or, or not. Um, and they have the following symbols. Double ampersand is your and. Double pipe, which by the way, the pipe is the uh, straight line that is connected to the backslash above your enter or return key. Uh, they're called pipes. You're going to learn the length. You're going to learn the names of lots of weird. In fact, do I actually know that they're called pipes, or have I just called them pipes throughout college and grad school? And it actually has another name. We call it that because in scripting, you pipe one command into another. But we're going to call them pipes, and it'll be fine. Double pipes um, will be or, and then not is just that bang, right? The exclamation point. So. What do these mean? We're going to use these operators to connect to larger things, right? So I might have two different comparisons, and I want to connect those two comparisons. And I'm going to do that with an and or an or maybe. Or I have a comparison, and I want to reverse it with a not. Um, and so what, what do they mean? Uh, oftentimes we'll use truth tables to sort of talk about this stuff. And I tend to think of stuff in terms of like circuit design. So you can picture like... If I have, so here A and B, A is going to represent a comparison. Um, you know, I feel hungry. B is another, or, you know, hungry equals true. And B could be another statement. Um, cash in wallet equals true. Okay, so if hungry equals true and cash in wallet equals true, uh, then stop by in and out right? Else... Uh, go home hungry. Oh, this is a terrible analogy, but you get what I'm saying. Like, there's a comparison that we're going to call A, a comparison we're going to call B, and these are going to be sort of our inputs. So, what's the result of the overall expression, right? Um, so here, input A only has two possibilities. It's either going to be true or false. Input B only has two two possibilities. It's going to be true or false. So then we can create this little table to show you what the true false value of the entire expression would be depending on, you know, what those input values are. Um, so here for and, I use the, um, probably better than, are you hungry and do you have money? Uh, although, uh, it, I'm recording this in the year 2020 during a pandemic, so this is not necessarily an irrelevant question, but uh, let's stick with the, your mom comes up and says, hey, uh, if you make your, if you clean your room and you make your bed, I don't know, you'll get ice cream or something. Right. So here's our comparison. I'm, she says, if you clean your room and you make your bed. So clean your room could be either true or false. If clean your room is true, so you did clean your room, 
and input B, major bed, major bed is also true, then the result of the entire expression is true. Mom says, if you clean your room and you make your bed, then you can get ice cream. If you clean your room and you make your bed, you'll get ice cream, right? If you clean your room and you don't make your bed, you don't get ice cream. The result of that expression is false. If you don't clean your room, but you do make your bed, you don't get ice cream. The result of that expression is false. If you don't do either, you definitely don't get ice cream. The result of that expression is false, right? That's kind of how you would read the truth table. And that's because and is only true when both of the inputs are true. When both the thing on the left and the thing on the right are true, then you know that the and would be true. Or kind of the opposite and also English-wise has some issues. So or is kind of the opposite in that I would say or is only false when both of the inputs are false, right? So and is only true when both of the inputs are true or is only false when both of the inputs are false. So if I say uh, I accept cash or check and you want to pay me with cash but no check, well, that's fine. If you want to pay me with no, with no cash but a check, also fine. If you want to give me some cash and a check, well, that's also fine. I accept both things, right? I accept cash or check. Here we're talking about inclusive or. The only time I ever have a problem is if you say, I don't want to give you cash or a check. I want to pay with a credit card. Well, no, I, I accept cash or check, right? At that point, you don't have either. Now we're in a, we're, the overall expression is false. The reason this is tricky in English is because there's another meaning that's not inclusive or. This is inclusive or. There's exclusive or. Uh, this would be you go to a restaurant and the waitress says, oh, yeah, your meal comes with super salad, right? You can have the soup, you can have the salad, but you can't have both, right? That's not an option. It's you're choosing this or this. Technically, with uh, exclusive or, you wouldn't be able to have neither either. This would be a very weird restaurant where they forced you to have either the soup or the salad. Like you have to have one. You can't have both, but you can't pass up either. Anyway, we're not dealing with exclusive or today, so you're fine. And and or. Only true when everything's true, only false when everything's false. Not is pretty simple. It just reverses whatever it is. The thing with not is to make sure you look at parentheses. If you're getting really complex, does the not apply to just the one thing, or does the not apply to something multiple things inside a parentheses. So you'd have to cut, you know, do whatever's inside the parentheses first, evaluate that, and then not the result, right? Um, but, I mean, I don't have to tell you what not is. It, it was a catchphrase in 1990 sitcoms, right? Like, oh man, that's a really cute sweater. Not, oh, see, you, you complimented my, my sweater, and then you said not, which reversed the meaning of the sentence, and therefore it, you, you were saying, I do not have an attractive sweater. You get it. You know what not is. I don't have to teach you English. All right. So is this true for you? Or think about it in another way. Who would this be true for, right? Your age, and granted, we're obviously making up some variables here that kind of represent stuff that I could probably, you, know, you would understand, um, sort of often. This is not part of the program, but your age is less than 21 and your gender is equal to female. So obviously your age is an integer, your gender is some sort of a string, and we're comparing some stuff. This does not apply to me because both the left-hand side is false and the right-hand side is false, right? I do not identify as a female, nor am I under 21. I am well over. But, right, it may actually be true for you. And if that was the case, um, then this expression would be true for you. Now, notice if you... Uh, are 21 and female, uh, then you, this does not apply to you, right? Because that's not less than or equal to. You can be up to age 20, but not 21. So sometimes pay attention to those little operators. The edge cases, honestly, like most computer science classes, like half your quiz questions are all on edge cases. I tend to not do that so much. I want to, you know, like edge cases should be the edge case of the quizzes as well, right? But like, do you generally get it? But just note, in this case, if you're 21, the left side is false, therefore the entire thing is false. 
What about this one? I've gotten really crazy here, I'm super complex. And so you kind of have to break it down, right? Um, I can see that I've got some sort of a conditional and then there's an or. The other side of that or is a not with something in parentheses. So I'm gonna treat that all as like one big chunk. It's just a big, more complicated chunk. But the, the center point, the thing that all of this sort of pivots on is that or, right? And so if, because it's an or, both can be true, but really if either of those things are true, if any side of the or is true, this entire thing is gonna be true. So if the first letter of your name is equal to J. If your name's, if your first name starts with a J, this is true for you. You don't even have to worry about the second half. I mean, you could if you wanted to, but at that point, you can you can short circuit evaluate this thing and just not worry about it. The left hand, your name begins with a J. This is true for you. If your name does not begin with a J, now you have to pay attention to that second half. And the not in this case is outside of parentheses. So really, we're going to not whatever is inside the parentheses. What's inside the parentheses is another comparison. Actually, it's sort of another, you know, conjunction of two different, uh, you know, booleans in this case. So one, you are currently wearing a hat. I am. So by the way, my first name is Brian. My first letter of my first name does not begin with a J, right? So this is not true for me so far. Now I have to pay attention to the second half. One is you are currently wearing a hat and you have a beard. Okay, so I have a beard, but I'm not currently wearing a hat. So since the left-hand side of that and is false, that means that that entire statement is false for me. I'm not wearing a hat. I do have a beard, but it doesn't matter. I have to have both for the and to be true. So that inside is false. But then I nod it. By nodding it, I turn my false to a true because it's now true, the right-hand side of the or is true, which means this entire expression for me is true. The first letter of my first name is a J or I am not currently wearing a hat and having a beard. Okay, the English is kind of weird, but you get what I'm saying. The other th interesting thing is, as you get better with this, and if you ever take a class in like finite math, uh, you do sort of propositional logic, predicate logic, yada, yada, um, you'll start learning different rules and transformations. So for instance, not you are currently wearing a hat and you have a beard is the exact, I shouldn't say it's the exact same. It is the equivalent expression to this. Only pay attention to the second half of that or. Not you are currently wearing a hat or not you have a beard. Now why is that the equivalent? It's because if you go back to the first one, you can distribute that not across the inside, just like you would in math, right? If there was a three out there, you could multiply both sides by three. But in logic, when you do that, and you not the two things inside, you have to switch the and to an or. So not you are currently wearing a hat or not you have a beard. If this is confusing you, don't worry. You're not gonna have to write anything this complicated for your assignment. But it's just saying, hey, start thinking about this stuff, right? Like um, you can sort of make more complex things. And again, this is where you know, discrete math and pro, you know, propositional logic come in. Um, if I were to say that you are not rich and famous, I'm emphasizing the and because I think it'll be better for English. You are not rich and famous. What does that mean? Well, it means either you're not rich or you're not famous. You might not be either, but like that's also acceptable by or because we're talking about inclusive or here, right? In English, we even say would say it that way, right? You're either not rich or you're not famous. Because if either of those things aren't true, then you're not rich and famous. I think that makes sense, right? Anyway, if this feels squishy for you, it's okay. Let it be squishy. There will be other classes some other day that aren't a beginning C++ class that will help you out with logic. Uh, also, some good philosophy classes out there teach mathematical uh, logic and it might be helpful. If you're taking GE anyway, you know, why not? All right, so here, LSIF. LSIF gives you some more options. The idea here is you've got your, the if works exactly the same. Uh, notice here I'm using single commands, no curly braces. That's honestly just so I can get it to fit on the slide. We normally put curly braces there for your blocks. 
but if some sort of conditional statement command, done. The bottom one, else command, also normal, right? That's our standard if else. The else is the default. It does not have a conditional statement. If none of the things above it are true, then you do the else. If the else isn't there, then if none of the things above are true, you do nothing, right? Um, but in between, I can create like, why, why have a, a fork which has two options, right? I could have three options. I could have four options. I mean, you can picture this thing as like one of those roundabouts in Europe that has like, you know, 15 different options, places you can go. You can create as many of these as you want. You just have to put all of the ones in the middle are else if. Now, why is the, the phrase else if sort of important? It's because that else implies that the things above it weren't true. So something else needs to be true, else if there's a new conditional statement you have to match to do that second block of commands. But we're also saying that nothing above us was untrue. Basically, the way this works is you work from your top to the bottom, and if you match one of these conditional statements, you do that block of commands and you exit. You don't come back and check the other ones, right? You only follow one. These are mutually exclusive. If you want something that's not mutually exclusive, you have to have separate if-else branches, right? Here, it's you match one. The first one you match, you exit. But you can have as many of these else-ifs as you want. So here is my little algorithm to determine your favorite musical artist based on utter stereotype and gender and age. And it's never been correct. Actually, that's not true. It's been correct twice. I think I've been teaching almost a decade now. Now eight years at Fresno City College. It's fine. Point being, let's check it out. If age is less than 18 and gender equals female, your favorite musical artist is Billie Eilish. Actually, I really like Billie Eilish, so maybe I'm a teenage girl. Don't know. I'm just saying. We have things in common, right? She won every Grammy. Everybody likes Billie Eilish. Else, if age is less than 18, your favorite artist is Post Malone. Now, notice, I have the exact same conditional as I had above. But what that else if is saying is the thing above must not have been true, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? So if it's true... Or if it's not true that, you know, age is less than 18 and gender is equal to female didn't happen, then what can we say about people who are Post Malone fans, right? What, how would we describe these people? They are teenagers. Well, I can't say teenagers because 18 and 19 aren't included here. Uh, they're under the age of 18 and they're either male, you know, non-binary. They're not female, right? They don't identify as female. That's all we know. And if that's you, you're a fan of Post Malone. Else if your age is less than 30. Now notice here, I didn't put a gender specifier on, right? There's, there's no gender specifier for the 30 bracket, right? So anybody between the ages of 18 and 29, regardless of gender, your favorite artist is Taylor Swift. I know, I'm right. But there's no gender category there. And also notice that what can I also say? I can say that these are only people who are between the ages of 18 and 29, right? Because I don't have less than or equal to here. So it didn't count. But if you're 17, you are not a Taylor Swift fan. Why? Because you already got picked up by one of the previous two, right? You were either Billie Eilish or Post Malone. You're not going to get this far into our, our little terrible algorithm of musical nonsense, right? But age less than 30, which means between 18 and 29, because people less than 18 have already been taken, Taylor Swift is your favorite musical artist. Else if age less than 45 and gender equals male, your favorite artist is My Chemical Romance. That might be true, don't know. But what can we say about people who are My Chemical Romance fans according to my algorithm here? We can say uh, that uh, you are 30, or between the ages of 30 and 44, right? So 30 to 44, and uh, you identify as male, right? If that's true, then your favorite artist is My Chemical Romance, which weirdly, that's the category I fit into, and uh, I do actually really like MCR, so yeah, there you go. Uh, else if, age less than 45, your favorite artist is Drake, 
Now, who can we describe as Drake fans? There are people between the ages of 30 and 44, because if they were under 30, they would have been Taylor Swift fans or Post Malone fans or Billie Eilish fans. Um, so between the ages of 30 and 44, and they don't identify as male. Female, again, non-binary, something else, right? Done. They're Drake fans. You all like Drake. I don't know, hopefully this gets a chuckle from somebody. Uh, else, you like Adele. Adele is basically my default. Because A, I mean, if you don't love Adele, then what the heck? I don't care. If you're, if you're eight, you love Adele. Like, she's a, a world treasure. But, and also, by the way, as a former emo, the greatest emo artist of all time, despite the fact she wouldn't say that. But what I'm saying is, else Adele. So who, well, who, how, how do we describe Adele fans? Adele fans are anybody 45 or older, right? Anybody, 40, anybody 44 or less has already been taken up by one of the previous artists. So Adele fans are 45 years or older. And here is this sort of like big if-else statement. Um, notice I made my job so much easier because I went in order of age, right? Because we matched the first one and then exit, if I had done a bunch of like, oh, let's say I want to do like My Chemical Romance people first. So then I would have to say, if age is less than 45 and age is uh, greater than 29 and gender equals male, right? I have to put like both the age ranges because I started there, right? It's so much easier if you either start from lowest to highest or highest to lowest, your options, but like, because you're eliminating people as you go, if you put stuff in order, it makes it a little bit easier. So think about the general structure of your branch, um, and you know that'll make some of your conditionals a little bit easier to write. So here is a tricky situation. What is the output of this program? I'm actually going to pause a second, let you think about it. I alluded to it earlier. Clearly, cake is 1, and I say if cake is equal to 5, then the cake is a lie. Otherwise, yay, there's cake. So you would think, yay, there's cake. But it's not true. And anybody who's ever played Portal knows the cake is a lie, right? Why? It's because of that little assignment operator in the conditional. To compare values, we use two equal signs. But here's where C++ gets weird. C++, if you write it badly, you write it badly if I'm speaking badly if you write bad code the code you write is bad but also perfectly valid C++ cake equal to five that's an assignment operator not an equality operator we're not checking the equality of those two things I just reassigned the value of cake to five the value of that expression cake is equal to five has the value of five and in part, that's because sometimes you want to chain uh, assignments. So you actually, whatever's on the right, that whole expression, even though it did something, assigned a value, it also has a value itself. And that value is the thing on the right, which is five. Because when we look at Booleans, especially numeric Boolean, like we're using a number or something, something is false if it is the Boolean false, right? If it is zero, or if it is null, and we haven't gotten to like objects and stuff yet, so ignore the null part, but you know what zero is. If I said if zero, then that would be true. Sorry, then that would be false. But anything else, even if it's a negative number, whatever, if it's non-zero, it has the value of true. So this if cake is equal to five, that is equal to five, which is true, which means the cake is a lie. And what happened? Like, you know, there, there's a, a joke you know, you write some bad C++ code, what's the error that, you know, pops up as a result of this? And the answer is often, uh, there is no error. You just get results you didn't anticipate. C++ will not give you an error for this. Uh, some IDEs will actually point that out, like, hey, I think you made a mistake here, because uh, they're trying to do you a favor, which is nice. I like that, you know. I, I'm in favor of safety systems whenever possible, but um, that according to the C++ standard, is not actually an error. You intended for that to be five, you intended for that to be true, and you intended for us to take the top branch. 
Uh, often the compiler will actually tell you there's no way to get to the else branch, so why did you write it? Which will lead you hopefully to where the error is. But just be, pay attention when you're trying to check for equality, use two equal signs, not one. It is the most common mistake amongst first semester computer programming students. All right, quickly, because we're going to use them less often, but you may run into them every once in a while. There are different ways of doing conditionals without doing an if. We'll talk about the two, kind of, I guess, the silver and bronze, but like by a long shot. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of how to use them. So the conditional operator is a way of writing a single line of code that will evaluate to one of two possible values. You have a conditional statement, just like the ones we talked about. It could be really long and complex. Uh, and then you follow that conditional statement with an or a, a question mark. After the question mark, you put a value. This is the value you want this entire expression to evaluate to if the conditional is true. Colon, the value you want this entire thing to um, evaluate to if the conditional is false. That means that this operator, which is the question mark colon, actually gets split and there's an operand stuck in between the two. Uh, operands are just the things that operators work on. In the expression 2 plus 3, the 2 and the 3 are operands to the plus operator, right? In this case, we have three operands. That's why this is often called the ternary operator, because it has three operands, and I think it's the only one that does that. But regardless, conditional operator, ternary operator, eh, call it what you want to. Um, but conditional statement, value of true, value of false. So let's look at a couple examples here. I've got credit score is equal to 500, double interest rate equals credit score greater than 750, question mark 4.6 colon 6.6. Here I'm actually assigning the value of your interest rate based on your credit score. If your credit score is above 750, you get the lower rate. If not, you get the higher rate, right? That entire expression to the right of the assignment operator is going to evaluate to either the number 4.6 or 6.6. So it's not going to evaluate to it starts with the thing on to the left of the question mark, which is going to evaluate to a Boolean, but the entire expression is going to either evaluate to, is going to evaluate to a float, either 4.6 or 6.6, right? Based on your credit score. Classic example of how to use it. And when it's simple, by the way, perfectly okay. Uh, if you start nesting ternary operators together, somebody's gonna throw a stapler at you at work. Like that, that's really hard to read it gets really, really confusing really, really fast. Ternary operators are really helpful when your, your use case is simple. Otherwise, use a more common branching technique or something. Here's another example, um, and here's another example of how I can get funky. Uh, here I've got a score of 80, and so then I'm going to see out. I'm going to pass a string. What string am I going to pass? Am I either going to pass fail or pass? Um, and I'm going to choose that based on your score. If your score is less than 60, we're going to send fail. Otherwise, we're going to send pass. Easy, right? But notice I have a whole bunch of parentheses, and why is that? So, you know, we talk about the order of operations in math, right? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, parentheses, exponents, you know, addition or uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Here's the thing. C++ has a lot more operators than just that, and all of those operators have precedence, right? And so it turns out that the kind of arrow arrow operator for C out, uh, that redirect operator, has higher precedence than the, all the comparison operators and the ternary operator itself. So like you kind of need to put stuff in parentheses so that what you're sending to the C out is one thing. It's either fail or pass, but the C++ compiler is actually going to parse it wrong if you don't put in the parentheses. Because it's going to see, oh, you want me to see out score, and then you want me to compare that to 60? I don't know how to compare a stream to a number. There's going to be an error. Um, you need parentheses because of that, the order of operation stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, conditional operators, use them when it's simple. Otherwise, don't. It's not very readable. Then, what I actually do use... Uh, quite a bit are switch statements. Switch statements are really nice, especially if you're doing like menu commands or where you just have a few different options. Um, and basically what you do with a switch statement is you evaluate an expression and then you try to evaluate that expression to
to match one of several cases that have been placed inside of the switch, right? It's kind of like chaining a long list of else ifs, but without all of the, you know, else ifishness of it, right? Um, I don't know. It, there's lots of different ways of expressing stuff in code. All of these can be expressed in, you know, using the if else stuff, right? Like if you don't know either of these other two, you're going to be able to solve your problems just fine with if and else uh, and else if, right? But sometimes it's just easier to express something in a way, like it's in English, right? Sometimes it's easier to just say something in a particular way rather than saying it in an equivalent way that uses more words. Um, switch statements will sometimes work that way. So here we have switch and then an expression of some sort. That expression can evaluate to anything that I can check against a literal, kind of. C++ has some exceptions, more modern languages can have more options. But here, um, I have each literal has a like case literal. So like case one, case two, case three, case four. And then inside are a bunch of commands. Now notice there's no curly braces. I don't know where this comes, well I mean it comes from C. So somehow this sort of missed the whole block of code stuff that you know we use for other things. And so it's going to just start executing commands. They just get listed right after the case. Then you have to use the keyword break to get out of the switch. If you don't, you will just keep doing all the commands for all the cases that follow, which is really, really weird. Um, and most languages make you put in the breaks for these sorts of switch statements, uh, with the exception being something like um, Swift, for instance, actually says, well, wait, hold on, like 99.9% .9 of the time you want breaks on every case. So why don't we make that default, the default and then we'll have you use pass through to, don't worry about other languages. I'm just saying this feels very clunky to me. This feels like the equivalent of you know, English, you know, but like Shakespearean English. This feels like something I should be typing in like the 1960s with all these breaks. Uh, regardless, I have a default case. The default case will match all of the, uh, anything that isn't one of the cases above. Let's do a real example here. So here I've got an int x, because I'm feeling generic. We set it to the value of one. We are gonna switch on x, which is by the way, the way you would say it in English if you're a programmer. I'm switching on x, you know, switch on x. And then I've got a block, but the block is just all of my cases. So case one, I'm literally just putting case one, colon, uh, see out you entered one, break, right? Well, since x has the value of one, I'm going to evaluate that expression after the switch, x evaluates to just one, that matches case one, so that's what's gonna end up getting printed. If it was a two, then it would match case two, and it would say you entered two, and then we break. If it was three, it would match the default, and it would print out unsure. Notice the default doesn't need a break, but that's only because it's at the bottom. You could put the break in if you wanted to, but it's kind of unnecessary because you're going to exit the switch regardless. There's nothing below it to run into. Now you can match against integers, which is by the way, the most common. You can also match against uh, characters. So here are character X equals B, and this kind of makes sense because these are just integers at the end of the day in ASCII code. Notice the cases here actually are case single quotes A, right, because that's what I'm trying to match against. Um, but we get the exact same type of flow. Um, you cannot match against strings. If you remember from earlier, I said strings aren't exactly like a native type in C++. This is kind of where it gets funky. Um, and so there is no way for C++ to tell whether one string is equivalent to another string or not. Um, and so you can't use them. You can in other languages, but not C++. So you're sort of limited a bit with your switch. In general, you're matching to, um, to integers. Also, you can't match to range. You can kind of match to ranges, but you have to like list all the cases separately. It's kind of a weird thing. Switch is best when it's just low number integers. Um, here, you notice it says int x equals one, switch x. Here I've got case one, case two. Basically what that means is whether or not you entered one or two, I'm gonna say you entered two because case one doesn't have a break at the end of it, so it's just gonna flow right into case two and then do that C out and then hit that break and leave. Um, and so, you know, as you play around with switches, you'll kind of figure out how they, they flow, but it does feel a little bit like Shakespearean English. Now, we are done with branches. You've gotten all your comparisons, all your logic, everything you need to know. This last skill is 
technically speaking, unnecessary, especially for week three of a uh, computer programming class. But what it does is it allows us to create assignments that are a bit more fun because they get to be a bit unpredictable, which means we're going to talk about getting random numbers. Um, I like to use games as projects. I think that's kind of more fun. Um, and so anyway, the only way I can do that is if you have the ability, like right now you have the ability to get numbers from users using CN. You have the ability to compare numbers to one another, right? Oh, well, that's helpful. Um, and if you know how to generate random numbers, now we can actually create games. Anything from blackjack to poker to, you know, whatever. Well, you might need some loops at some point, but that's coming next week. Point being, we need to seed a random number generator, or we need to figure out how to generate a random number. To do this, we're going to have to do some kind of mathy stuff, and we're going to have to include a couple other libraries. One is C time, the other is the C standard library. The C standard library has all the random number generation generating uh, functions in it, and C time has the time functions, which I'm going to tell you why we need that in a second. But first, let's talk about how you generate a random number. So the first thing you need to know is that computers cannot generate random numbers. It is impossible. There is no such thing as a perfect random number generator for a computer. You can just like be like, oh, I don't know, 42. Random number. Actually, it's not. It's from a Douglas Adams book. But like still, random enough, right? You have a nice, soft, squishy, chemical brain that can come up with random numbers. Depending on your religion and philosophy, maybe the number you come up with it was actually predetermined at the beginning of the universe. You know, just for right now, let's assume free will and assume you can come up with random numbers. Computers, though, cannot. And so there are actually really, really nice libraries out there that will help you to, to generate more random numbers than what this will do. This is like your basic included in the base package C++. You do it in beginning classes. You would not want to generate random numbers this way for any sort of real purpose. But because it could get hacked. You could find a pattern, right? Because um, there's only a certain number of patterns that are possible. Uh, it might be thousands, but that's still, computers can process thousands of things pretty quickly. So what are we gonna do? Uh, the first thing we need to do to generate a random number is we need to seed our random number generator. Um, so we have to basically put in a number into our random number generator, and that number is gonna be used, along with some fancy math, to come up with a series of numbers that are effectively random. And so we're going to use the srand function for that. srand is part of the C standard library and it will allow you to seed your random number generator with a number. Now if I were to do srand5, right, I would get the same numbers every time. Meaning the numbers wouldn't be the same every time. I would get like 2, 8, 3, 6, right? But when I stopped my program and I reran it, I would get two, eight, three, six, right? Like the order would be the same. It wouldn't be the same number every time, but it would be the same order. Um, and so you would just have to, you know, take the slot machine, unplug it, replug it back in, and hey, guess what? I know exactly how many times it's gonna be before this thing hits. Um, don't know why I'm talking about Vegas, it's fine. Point being, srand, I need to seed it with a number that is also random. I just told you computers can't generate random numbers, so how are you going to do this? The only way to do it is by getting a number that is effectively random. So we're going to use the current time. All computers, I shouldn't say all computers, I'm sure there's one in the world somewhere that probably doesn't use Unix time, but like, I, I've never touched that machine and you probably won't either. Most computers in the world use Unix time to represent time. What is Unix time? Unix time is the number of seconds that have passed since January, since midnight of January 1st, 1970, right? The number of seconds that have passed since that, that is a very large number, but it's also a number that I can't really predict. If you were to ask me right now, you know, what number, how many seconds have passed since, you know, that I could not tell you that down to the ones digit. I mean, I couldn't even tell you that rounded off to the nearest million. Like, I don't know, right? But, uh, you know, your computer knows, so you just take the current time, you send it as your seed your random number generator. Now here's the thing, in five to five to 10 minutes, even if you were to tell me right now what that number is, 
in five to 10 minutes, you ask me again, I wouldn't know, right? Like it's, it's a effectively random number and it's changing all the time. So we can use that to seed our random number generator. We're using a semi-random number to seed our random number generator. It will then use that number to do its fancy math to come up with a series of random numbers. And every time you run your program, unless you happen to run it on, yeah, it, it's going to be effectively different every time. All right? So that's how you start seeding your random number generator with something that is kind of random. Then you, to create a random number, you just have to use the rand function. So rand to think you don't have to send anything to rand and that will give you a large random number. All right. Probably shouldn't say this and the thing you're supposed to get here is you have to see your number random random number generator, create the random number, and then you can use it however you want. Um, this slide tells you about the whole, you have to pass a semi-random number into it. Um, you'll get these slides as well. And then, you, and by the way, you only have to do this once for your entire program. You can create as many random numbers as you want afterwards. You just seed it once at the beginning and you're good. Then to create a random number, um, you use the rand keyword. Now rand is going to give you a large random number. And so we don't want that. I mean, or we probably don't want that. Depends on what you're doing. What I need to do is like give it a range, right? So like, let's say we're doing a little guessing game. I want you to choose a number between one and 10, right? Well, then I need to limit my numbers. So if rand is a very large number, then what I could do is I could divide it by 10 and take the remainder. That's that modulus operator that we were talking about last time. If I do that, then I know I'm going to get a number between zero and nine, right? Because if I can't get 10, because if I got 10, then that would just add one to the quotient and my remainder would be zero, right? I'm dividing by 10. So yeah, by using that, that remainder, you know, operation, you're going to get a smaller number. In case, specifically with 10, you would get a number between 0 and 9. Now, it is very uncommon to say, hey, let's play a guessing game. Guess a random number between 0 and 9. I could switch that to 11, which would be fine. Then I would get 10 as an option, but I would still have 0 as an option, which is kind of still weird. Nobody says, you know, hey, guess a random number between 0 and 10. Although technically, if I was holding my fingers behind my back, right, zero is an option. But anyway, nobody says that. So once you mod by 10, you can just add one to the result, and that will give you, it goes from zero to nine, now it's one to 10, right? You can do that for anything. So, you know, rand mod three is going to give me a number between zero, uh, zero, one or two, right? Because it can't be three. Otherwise, I would just add one to the quotient. My remainder would be zero. Um, and then I could add one to it, and that would give me a random number between one and three. So that sort of pattern will work, right? That gives me a random number. And I can now use that random number in my program however I want to. I can compare it to maybe a number that you gave me and see if you're right, see if you're too high, see if you're too low, whatever. Um, you know, I could use this to, you know, randomly roll a 20, uh, um, you know, a fictional digital 20-sided die to see whether or not you hit that ogre. You know, um, Dungeons and Dragons reference. It's fine. If you don't get it. But what I'm saying is we can now play with some games and that's going to be at least a little bit more fun and hopefully add some color to the class. So anyway, generating random numbers, unneeded, but for this class, we're going to throw it in to make things more entertaining. So hope you're having a good week. If you have any questions, obviously send me a message through Canvas. And uh, yeah, I'll see you online.